Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It's a great turnout. Um, beautiful weather outside, so thanks for coming inside with us for a little bit to learn. Um, my name is Craig Maxwell. If you haven't met before, I'm the Southern Piedmont Chapter Chair of the North Carolina Native Plant Society. Um, today, we have Sarah Gagne with us, who uh, she is an associate professor uh, of uh, landscape ecology at UNC Charlotte. She's also the head of the uh, geology and earth sciences department. Yeah. Geography yeah. and Earth Sciences Department. Um, and she's going to be talking about her book, Nature at Your Door, which we have some, uh, she has some copies up here available for sale. We're also going to have some available uh, with the raffle with the plants. Uh, uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce Sarah. Uh, thank you for coming. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real great pleasure to be here today. So Reedy Creek, I'm originally from Canada, moved to Charlotte in 2010 for the position at UNCC, but Reedy Creek was the first park I discovered that I was in just kind of love it. So I love coming back here any chance I can get. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about nature at your door and beyond. Um, I will mention right now that uh, a lot of the photographs in this presentation were taken by my colleague, Bill Garcia, in our department, a senior lecturer in my department. And so this is our local northern water snake who hangs out at the pond at the UNCC Botanical Gardens. And I wanted to share with you the three messages that I'm hoping that you'll come away with from today. So first, nature is alive and well where you live. So I think almost all of us, myself included, an urban ecologist, assume that nature in urban and suburban places is somehow less than, is not as good quality as nature elsewhere outside of the city. It's species poor. You're not going to find real nature in urban and suburban places. The more urban ecology I do, the more urban ecology that's done, we're finding that that is definitely not the case. The more we look, the more species we find in urban and suburban places. That being said, the second message is you can be just as connected to nature in your town or city as elsewhere. If nature is alive and well where you live in your urban and suburban places, then you don't need to go to a state park or a national park outside of town or your city to get meaningful, deep connections with nature. You can do that right where you live. And then my third message is you can enhance nature at your door. So I think in this era of extreme change, we're facing several very significant environmental challenges, so biodiversity loss and climate change. I think we need to shift the message and accept and realize that we have had a positive impact on the planet. We have made some progress in mitigating climate change, for instance, and we need to have a positive focus and continue that good work and, and have hope for the future, right? And have more of a positive mindset as we move forward. Okay, so I'm gonna start the story here with spiders. And who in the crowd, does anyone like spiders? I do. Yes, okay, <laughs> like likes to have spiders, you know, like handles them and stuff like that. Kind of, okay, good, <laughs> excellent. Okay, excellent. So this is obviously the right crowd for that. I definitely, I'm fascinated and like spiders. I'm not sure if I you know, want to pick up spiders or anything like that, but I do find them extremely fascinating. I'm starting here because this is when I really started to look at spaces near my house. I live in Sedgefield, so in my neighborhood, and try to find species. So this started in the pandemic for me. I had about a one-year-old at the time, so I was home, the daycare was closed. And we were wandering around with my phone trying to find stuff in the yard and in the house. And the, one of the first things I found was this bright blue, black and white spider on my deck. And I've not seen it since. It was really striking in appearance. So I looked it up. This is an ant mimicking spider. What these spiders do, their body shape kind of looks like the shape of an ant. They go into ant nests 
find like a comfortable little hole, emit chemicals so that they don't disturb the ants, that ants will leave them alone and spend their life eating the ants. <laughs> and that's what they do. And so this was just on my deck and I thought this is blowing my mind. This whole other complex world that's occurring probably under my deck or next to my deck somewhere. And this fascinating creature. So I spent a little bit more time with iNaturalist, which I'll talk about in a second, looking for other spiders around my house. I found, the slide is a little cut off here, but a tan, uh, a tan crab spider on my uh, son's desk. We spent a lot of time outside, so probably came in with us. A uh, bold jumping spider, which you've probably seen, we've got lots of those. And then another kind of jumping spider, maybe on a towel or something. At about this time, as you recall, a lot of people were getting outdoors and trying to find stuff during the lockdown. And that was the case with three postdocs in Brisbane. They started with spiders similarly. So they were cleaning out their house, vacuuming out their closet, and they noticed there were lots of spider species in their closet. They didn't want to kill them all. And so they brought them outside, but then they thought, that's a lot of spider species. Let me see what else is occurring in my house and yard. And they got online and started the Stay Home Biodiversity Challenge to motivate others to do the same. And less than a year after they started, they found a thousand species in wow. their home and yard. The thousand being a mosquito. So that was a thousand species that they found. <laughs> But they found 747 species of insect, 97 plant species, 53 birds, 38 arachnids, I think it's 14 fungi, 9 reptiles, 8 mammals, and 2 amphibian species. And, exactly. <laughs> and all of this was in a yard one-tenth of an acre. So they were in a huge property. Yes, they're in Brisbane, it's more tropical than here, but it's still a relatively small area. So I'm going to supplement this with a, a few other statistics here, just from some recent um, studies. I'll actually do that in the next slide. So let me bring it to Charlotte first, and I'll talk about iNaturalist. Okay, so has anyone used iNaturalist? Probably a few people. That's great. It's actually surprising in other groups where I've given this talk, very few people have heard of iNaturalist or use it, which I think it should be much more widely used because it's such a powerful app. If you've not used it, it's really great. Um, it's probably, I think, the best biodiversity app out there. I think for plants as well, it's particularly good. So it uses artificial intelligence to suggest species for the photo that you upload of the plant or insect that you found. But then the other interesting thing that it does is it uses the power of the community of users. So it'll check what other people have located in your neighborhood or identified in your neighborhood. And then it'll ask other users to comment on your identification, right? Either to confirm it or say, no, I think you found a different species of spider. And then once two thirds of that community agree on an identification, that observation becomes research grade. And so that means it's actually used and it's more and more used by scientists to look at the effects of climate change on species, the spread of invasive species, all kinds of different kind of global issues. It's a really powerful data set. So thinking about species in urban and suburban places, I wanted to move from Brisbane and look at Charlotte. So these pins here are all the iNaturalist observations in the area with the airport and uptown Charlotte indicated there for scale. And I decided to go into the 277 loop to see what I could find. And I only looked for research grade observations. And I found in the 277 loop, 418 species observed by 290 users. As I said, this is conservative. These are research grade. 
And this is a really small number of observers getting 418 species, right? So that's only a species and a half about per observer. So statistically, if you're an ecologist and I see those numbers, like there are way more than 418 species in this area, right? More people can be looking and the people who are looking can be spending a lot more time doing that. So out of those 418, I'll show you a few of these. So they found, people found 147 species of plants and I've selected some natives for you. So yellow crown beard, Virginia sweet spire, May apple, Carolina horse nettle, partridge pea, black eyed Susan, my favorite, so Carolina snail seed. So does anyone have this? in their yard, has anyone heard of this mm -hmm. one? I was gonna pull this one. So this is just like an unassuming vine. It was in my herb garden and I was gonna pull it, but then I used a naturalist and figured out what it is. And so this is a native vine that just comes up spontaneously out of the ground. Uh, it feeds birds. It's very gentle and unassuming. It doesn't go wild. It doesn't take everything over. And so I've left it in my yard and it keeps popping up here and there. So another native, I love native vines. So Carolina snail seed in Uptown. We also have uh, pink ladies and then late bone scent. So 147 species of plants. 67 bird species have been observed in Uptown Charlotte. American woodcock and Baltimore oriole. So American woodcock, some of these species that are being observed are migrants, right? So they're not necessarily staying in uptown for the breeding season, but they are stopping in uptown and taking a rest on their journey. So using the habitat. And that was definitely the case with the woodcock. So the picture that I saw, it was in somebody's kind of tiny yard doing what woodcocks do. Uh, Baltimore Oriole, pileated woodpecker, our brown-headed nuthatch. So this is a, an important species for our state. It's been declining quite a bit. If you put out nest boxes for nuthatches, that's gonna make a big difference. Another species that has exhibited steep decline. So red-headed woodpecker, we've lost 54% of the red-headed woodpecker across the continent since 19. 66. So that's another species declining, but in uptown. And I've seen that along Tryon as well, a little south of uptown. Cooper's hawk in uptown. We've got a Cooper's hawk in Sedgefield. Uh, I have like this secret peach tree in Sedgefield that I go visit uh, every once in a while. And the Cooper's hawk hangs out in that kind of thicket and waits for birds and its meal. And then some more migrants. So black and white warbler, black throated blue warbler, and then also a great horned owl nesting in Uptown. So lots of birds. We had uh, not uh, five species of amphibians. And to remind you, amphibians are the most threatened vertebrate taxa globally. So green tree frog, Cope's gray tree frog, green frog. 13 species of reptile, including our box turtle, which I've had in Sedgefield in my yard as well. Easter copperhead, red-bellied snake, so lots of snakes in Uptown. Seven species of mammal, including the Eastern red bat, the coyote, I've seen a coyote in Sedgefield, I'm sure many of you have seen coyotes around, and white-tailed deer. And then rounding this out, 15 species of spider. Here's our canopy jumping spider, green lynx spider, and uh, an intimidating looking southern house spider. 130 species of insects, eastern eyed click beetle, glossy winged sharpshooter, our monarch, and then 21 species. Oh, I've got one more, I think, insect, a couple more. Polyphemus moth. Here's a ground beetle. This is the group that I study. And then finally, 21 species of fungi. So here's our Eastern uh, American jack-o'-lantern fungi. So this is, I'm hoping, a lot more than you would have assumed was in Uptown if you're going there for a walk or going out for lunch on any given day. 
And let me just give you two other statistics now, just to bring the point home. There was a global study of 481 cities around the world looking at bird and plant diversity. They found that a fifth of the world's avian diversity occurred in those 481 cities, as well as 14,420 plant species, several globally endangered species as well. And then if we bring it to the US, of 481 urbanized areas with populations of more than 50,000, so this is a census designation, all of them contain one or more bird species that are threatened at the state level. The average for any of those urbanized areas is 49 of those state threatened species. And then 81% of them contain um, at least one federally threatened species. So our cities not only have a lot of species, but they also have rare um, species of conservation concern that we need to protect. So showing you what we had in Brisbane, what we have in Charlotte, these statistics, I think you're getting the picture that nature is alive and well where you live. I think the more we look, the more we're gonna find in our urban and suburban places. So now, that being said, let's think about your connection to nature. So this actually, I realized when I picked this, this is taken just out here. So a little <laughs> picture of a forest ecosystem. I'm thinking about connections with nature in the context of an ecosystem, uh, because that is how ecologists kind of think of it. An ecosystem is defined by relationships between things. Does anyone know, remember, what an ecosystem is and define it. Yes. I'm an ecology professor. So. Oh, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, you do. Go for it. Okay, so an ecosystem is just a, an area that that term encompasses all of the living organisms and also all of the abiotic factors and non like the water and the soil and rocks and, and the air, um, all of that stuff, all of the you know, organisms and the environment itself comprise an ecosystem. Makes sense. An ecosystem um, you can have a habitat within an ecosystem. Um, a, a habitat is um, kind of a more localized sort of thing where an ecosystem is, is kind of a more official term that we use to refer to um, a whole area. So this might be, you know, it, within Reedy Creek, we've got um, a deciduous forest type ecosystem, which contains all of the creeks and all the trees and all the hills and all the everything. The habitat um, is something that would refer to more of a certain type of the pine trees for the pine board, Exactly, yes. Yeah. The pine trees are, are the habitat for the pine board. The streams would be the habitat for the salamanders. Okay. Like Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. But thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, that's what I would say. Like a habitat is from the species perspective. Like this is the species habitat. Uh, but coming back to this ecosystem, so we are, I'm going to get to eventually, we're part of an urban ecosystem. But if we just kind of recall what an ecosystem is, so it's this interconnected web of living and non living elements. So all the different organisms that live in an area and the air, soil, uh, the mineral part of the soil and the water. So those are the abiotic elements and the interactions between all of those things. So in this part of the world, we're most familiar with the forest ecosystem. When we think about an ecosystem, the types of things that are in a forest ecosystem are obviously the trees and the other vegetation that occur there. We've got a whole army of invertebrates and filamentous fungi in the soil um, living that you can't see here. And then a variety of different herbivores and predators and animals of all kinds, as well as, like I said, the air, minerals, uh, and water. And those things are all connected through what we call ecological processes, but those are our relationships. So our trees are photosynthesizing. So they're taking up carbon dioxide and water from the air, making glucose, 
and material for their tree branches, et cetera, and putting out oxygen. Uh, they are, when leaves fall, um, they are being decomposed. So decomposition is occurring in that soil layer. Our herbivores and predators are also decomposing. And then everybody is respiring. So just like we're doing now, so we're taking oxygen from the air and we're putting out CO2 and water vapor. And we're doing that to do what we do to provide us with energy. So those are our relationships. And the last point I want to make here is that those relationships are often reciprocal. So each thing depends on the other. It couldn't exist without other elements in the system. The oak, for instance, is producing an acorn. It's eaten by a squirrel. That squirrel is ultimately getting decomposed into nutrients. Those nutrients are then taken up by the tree once more to create more acorns. So the tree is creating the habitat, in a sense, for the squirrel to exist. But then the squirrel is actually returning that favor in kind over time. So reciprocal relationships. We can bring that understanding, that kind of abstract understanding of how the system works to where we live. So this is a picture of uh, Country Club Heights, I think, slash Plaza Shamrock area. All of those relationships, photosynthesis, predation, decomposition are happening here, but this is now an urban ecosystem. And the definition of an urban ecosystem is this interconnected web of living and non-living organisms in which humans play a large role. So we're a big part of the picture here. We're adding all kinds of elements like houses, roads, utility poles, um, the species that we bring with us, ornamental plants, domestic cats, uh, all of those kinds of elements, our food, our fuel, goods, waste, all of that stuff is being added to the system. And then that is adding complexity to the system. Um, and the relationships are also becoming more complex because everything we do is influencing other elements in the system and we're being influenced as well. How often we mow our lawn, for instance, affects the invertebrate community in our lawn, uh, the lights we put on, how much we drive, the noise we create, uh, as well as beneficial things, right? The pollinator garden tea plant. All of those things are adding a ton of complexity. So this is my little diagram to say an urban ecosystem is the living, non-living um, part of the ecosystem, my bird and kind of mountain and sun, and humans play a big role in that. And there's one additional thing that's adding complexity to an urban ecosystem. And I'm, I'm a physical scientist. So I'm representing this by a thought bubble, which is very, very reductive if you're not a physical scientist. But I'll, I'll tell you where I'm going with this with a little story. So uh, my students and I recently published the likable, therefore abundant hypothesis. And it's pretty simple. So there's a lot of research that shows that people like and dislike different animals based on how they look and how they behave. And so we decided to see if that was the case for birds. We surveyed about 300 UNCC students that lived in the Charlotte metro area. We showed them all kinds of random combinations, pictures of birds from the area. And they ended up really classifying them according to this gradient of the most preferred bird, which was primarily blue or black, and an insectivore that foraged on the wing. And the least preferred bird would be what do you think? You had to pick the pardon me? Vultures. Not vultures. We didn't show them vultures because they were all songbirds. So a songbird sized sparrow. Uh, yeah, me too. Sparrow? <laughs> yes, a pigeon. It was actually a pigeon. It wasn't a sparrow, but it was a pigeon. So people didn't really like brown foraging birds that much. So sparrow would kind of fall into that. So it turned out to be a pigeon on like multiple indicators. Anyway, that being said, we've got variable, various likability, right, across species. 
Uh, the hypothesis then goes on to state that, well, we're going to, um, people are likely to make changes to their yard to encourage the species that they like to come to their yard, right? And conversely, we'll make changes to their yard to dissuade the species that they don't like. And if a lot of people do that, then that could have population level impacts and actually change the abundance of like species, right? They become more abundant. And the um, Eastern bluebird is a perfect example of that. That's, this remains to be tested, but that's like an unofficial test. The recent rebound in Eastern bluebird numbers is largely driven by people putting out nest boxes, right? So that's kind of, and they're primarily blue and insectivores. So, you know, maybe that's what's going on. I'm illustrating this and it links to my thought bubble because this shows that how people's perceptions, how they see the world and their attitudes, what they like and dislike are also major players in an urban ecosystem. They can drive and influence other elements and are influenced themselves by a variety of other elements in the system. And you can add to that uh, all kinds of societal patterns and processes norms, practices, values, our economy, our culture, all of that is added into this complex mix that urban ecologists so call a socio-ecological system, but this urban So that's our urban ecosystem that we're all actually a part of and interacting with things in. And it's where humans play a large role. There is interdependence among elements. And there's a large variety of interactions and relationships. So with that being said, and a kind of a broader understanding of where you are in this system, this links to you can be just as connected to nature in your town or city as elsewhere. You are part of a living and breathing and complex urban ecosystem wherever you live. Most people live in suburban and urban places. And then there's two implications to this uh, that actually mean that you can enhance nature at your door. You can make a big difference because you're living in an urban ecosystem to our crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. And I'm illustrating this with these two photos here. Uh, this photo on the left, so that's the AT&T building in Uptown. Uh, this is obviously a heavily modified landscape. So we've got pavement, cars, building, and a couple of little trees. If we can do this to a landscape, we play a large role in our urban ecosystem, right? We have the power to do something very different and to think about how to build and design cities that make room for a lot of other species other than us, right? Way more than what we're doing now. So we have that power to make a big difference. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, part of that big difference is gonna be accomplished by individual action. So an urban ecosystem is called a complex adaptive system by some people. It, that just basically describes what I described. We've got lots of different things interacting locally in indirect and direct ways. So this kind of mash of stuff, kind of like your brain, all your little neurons interacting. That means there's no single person, dog, salamander, tree, anyone directing how that system works or what happens with it. It's just a project product of all these little interactions. And so that means that change is gonna be challenging, right? It's gonna be difficult to achieve because it doesn't depend on any single person. It's all kinds of people, but it does mean that each of our individual actions make a difference. That, and we don't know whether our individual action will actually make a big difference because there's a lot of unpredictability in the system. 
So one way to mitigate or to change, you know, landscapes like this is this is my black tupelo that I planted last year. So planting trees, each of our individual actions can make a huge difference collectively in an urban ecosystem. And before I move on to talk more a little about birds and butterflies in your yard and park, some kind of concrete stuff, I'll just leave you with uh, this fact from the latest IPCC, so Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment, that said that 40 to 70% of carbon emissions by 2050 can be eliminated by individual action, eating less meat, taking fewer long haul flights, walking or cycling more, um, reducing food waste, uh, and increasing building energy efficiency. 40 to 70% of carbon emissions can be reduced doing those things. They're not all possible and they're not all possible for every person, right? But that is a reality that we should think about and embrace as we move forward. Okay. Okay, so that being said, so these are the kind of the big picture things, but I wanted to share with you a little bit about some specific relationships. So in your yard and in your park and how you're connected to birds and butterflies respectively. <coughs> so in your yard, how you manage nature in your yard matters just as much or more to birds than how much green space there is nearby. This is another one of those facts that actually is pretty astounding, I think. So th these are the cities where I've collected my evidence to support this statement. You can see that there's a lot of green in these cities. So I've got Ottawa, uh, there's even a lot of green in Phoenix, which is interesting. Um, and Chicago is up there and Hobart, uh, not New Zealand, in Tasmania, sorry about that. So how much of a city's green space do you think is represented in private land, in yards? If you had to come up with a percentage, a few people have measured this, not a ton of people, but wild guess. 50, 60, 50, 50 80. 80. So it's around there, it's a lot. So the minimum is a third, but often it's at least half or the majority of a city's green space is in private yards on private land. Not in nature preserves and parks, but it's on private land. So yards mean a lot then as habitat to species in urban and suburban places. So some evidence from each of these cities in Ottawa, the total number of native bird species, the number of bird species who primarily depend on forest, and the number of threatened species were similarly as dependent on yard vegetation as on public green space. Yeah. Um, just just with, with respect to uh, cities. Yeah. Like I look at this, and I'm from Long Island, New York. New York City does not have, does not look like that. So when we talk about cities and we talk about yards in cities, are we also including the cities like New York that, you know, offshore concrete pretty much? It, it, it depends. This is depends on the cities that were measured. There's probably like five or six estimates, but Boston is one of those estimates. Boston, we have not New York, not Manhattan. Not Manhattan, not Manhattan. That hasn't been measured. So no, there's going to be outliers for sure. But I think most of the cities are not like New York, right? They're mo most of them kind of look like this, okay. at least in the United States, Australia, Europe, where these measurements have been made. So the one thing with urban ecology is, yeah, you're sampling cities, but also you're mostly sampling them from former British, sorry, I'm Canadian, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, like Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. but it's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's um, more than half of Americans live in what the U.S. Census states are sent or suburban places, and then it's something like more than eighty percent live in suburban and urban places. So, all right. So, just my understanding of city is a little more, I guess. 
<laughs> well, it's part of yeah, it's part of the the reality. But yeah, so these are averages. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. No. Um. Okay. So that being said, so thinking about like these examples, and in a lot of places where we exist in Ottawa, they found that private green space is just as or just as important as public green space, and that includes for threatened species of conservation concern. And they also found that um, as a city grows, it's actually the public green space that gets eaten up, meaning that gets developed. So over time, as a city grows, it's the private space that becomes more and more important. At least that's what they projected. More evidence from Phoenix, so birds in neighborhoods responded twice as much to habitat features in front yards than to the distance to the nearest tract of, excuse me, desert habitat. They found about 21 desert bird species in front yards in Phoenix, and that's about a third of the total desert bird community in that area. Do you know why? Is it, is it just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> me? Oh, well, she, she's asking, do you know, do you know why that is? The urban suburban areas are so incredibly different. The urban suburban areas are not desert habitat for the most part. We grew up in all kinds of trees and lawn and things like that. So the suburban area there just totally different. A little bit of water and everything too. Yeah. yeah. That's why they try to talk more about doing their escape. Yeah, you know, exactly. Putting it the way it's supposed to be, not the way we need it. Yeah. Um, but so just to also just give a bit of context, so why that we're finding yards are so important for bird number of bird species is because there's a lot of birds that can use that kind of some trees, some lawn, mix of open and closed. Uh, you know, we've got bird feeders or providing other resources. So we're actually creating like very bird friendly habitats in yards that's attracting all kinds of different species. Uh, including species from forests and deserts and non-urban kind of pristine or, or habitats. And then, so in Chicago, number of bird species counted along residential streets is dependent to a greater extent on the wildlife resources in yards than on the area of open space, including forest preserves within two thirds of a mile. And then similarly in Hobart, garden characteristics had a bigger influence on the number and different types of native birds and the number of woodland birds than distance to native vegetation. So we can attract a lot of different bird species to yards. And like I said, the more we look, species that are nominally forest species around here actually occur in increasing numbers uh, in kind of suburban and urban places. So our Cooper's hawk is a forest species, for instance. All of these studies were finding significant number of forest or natural habitat species. And so I think part of what's going on is we've classified species as forest, uh, open area wetland, but we've never classified them as suburban or urban. And so they're finding what they need in the spaces that we're creating which is a normal process. I recently heard there's a bald eagle found nesting, a pair found nesting within the city of Toronto uh, limits, which is the a first since the 50s or something like that, or the 60s, and everyone's super surprised and it's wonderful, but the bald eagle is just going, we have tons of lakes and open areas. And so if you stock a lake with fish and put up some big trees next to it, it's pretty good, you know, for bald eagles. So they're going to find resources that they require if that's in our city or elsewhere. So this means yards are really important to birds in urban places. A lot of the estimates say they're more important than our parks and nature preserve. And those studies have also shown that it's small things that you do that can really make a difference to birds. In Ottawa, 10% more yard vegetation in the neighborhood, but you 20% more forest dependent or threatened bird species. That is a big deal. It's not a big change and a big bump in species that need our help. 50% of that desert bird community that they found were present if yards, I guess along kind of like a block 
contained just 10 desert tree species and 20 shrubs. That was in Phoenix. And then in Chicago, 10% more yards with at least one plant with fruit or berries. So meaning if there's 10 houses along a block, at least one of those houses has one plant with fruit or berries, you get two more bird species in that area. So these are really small manageable changes that have a big impact. So to, uh, to um, talk a little bit more specifically for birds, um, and this is a non-bird friendly part of my yard. So this is Slippers wearing his Bird Be Safe collar, uh, which I think works. I'll talk about that in a second. I've kind of collated just feasible, no nonsense things you can do to your yard to attract more birds. Number one, just add more vegetation of any kind. If you don't have a lot of time, you don't want to devote a lot of resources, just add more vegetation of any kind to your yard. Number two, choose plant species that attract birds. North Carolina Audubon Society has excellent lists of plants that you can choose to attract the birds that you like. Number three, and this is, this is an important one, diversify the type and structure of uh, vegetation in your yard. You want to go for diversity of different types of vegetation at each kind of horizontal level as you move up vertically. Some lawn, some planted beds, a variety of different plants in those kinds of areas, shrubs of different types and sizes, some vines, smaller trees, larger canopy trees. And you need to think like a bird. So think like a 3D vegetation, vegetative habitat. That's what you're creating. So that collar is just, just like a hair scrunchie, basically, and you put it over a regular cat collar. So you put the, and it's just the visibility. It makes the cat a lot more visible. It's also got um, to birds, but it's also got like a rim of um, high vis kind of reflective material. So at night, it makes the cat more visible too. There is concern on the other end of that. Yeah. Um, but it's not going to be afraid of it anyway. Like people put bells on cats and yeah. yeah. Well, the bird will hear the bell, but it doesn't know that the bell is set predators there necessarily. Yeah, I don't think the bells work. Yeah. Like it's it's so it's my understanding that this is the only thing you can attach to your cat, basically, that'll work. And that's because it's actually the bird can see the cat right. with that it collar. Break away? Do you worry about it getting caught with it? It's a it's the regular breakaway collar. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, the one downside, each thing is like 12 bucks. So, you know, if you, yeah, so if it breaks away, it's a little pricey, but I, I anecdotally have found that it works. And what I also do is I don't put slippers out at dawn and dusk. Right. So I expect, you know, now I don't do that. And then I put them out during the day with this thing. So, but, over here. okay. So I'll just recap this slide. These are easy things that you can do to make a big difference to birds in urban and suburban places. So add more vegetation to your yard, choose plant species that attract birds, diversify the type and structure of vegetation in your yard, going for that 3D kind of amount of habitat at all levels. Uh, bird feed, so provide supplemental food for birds, and then keep your cat indoors if you can't, or put the bird be safe collar or use a catio which is a patio for cats or a variety of other, there's cat runs, other things as well. Uh, okay, so that is. Add water to that as well, food slash water. Yeah. Yes, yeah, water, water for, yeah. Okay, so now let's just talk just for a few minutes, um, this last little piece here about your park and thinking about butterflies uh, and how they're influenced by your actions and might influence you in your park. So in Sedgefield, our park was not recently redesigned, maybe redesigned about 10 years ago or so now, but the paths actually form the shape of a butterfly. So we call it Butterfly Park. 
And it's a great example of how maintaining wild nature in your park enhances the number and types of butterflies that you find there. So that's how you influence nature. And then also wild nature in your park relieves stress and mental fatigue and improves your mood. And that's how nature influences you. So if we look at maintaining wild nature in your park enhances the number and types of butterflies you find there. So here's a park edge. This is Kilbourne Park. Uh, just off of Eastway near, I think, Country Club Heights, so that general area. Sedgefield Park and a lot of parks in Charlotte have this area of forest, right? So this kind of wild forested area, as well as maintained areas, similar to Reedy Creek in a sense, more maintained areas, some with flower beds, etc. This, a general rule in ecology is the more different types of habitat that you have, the more species you will have in that area. So greater habitat diversity leads to greater species diversity. So adding, having this forested area in a park in addition to maintained places will boost, means our parks have more butterfly species than if they didn't have the forest, right? That forest wild bit of nature is important. So we've got two different species here. So our open areas are gonna attract I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the, the sashem skipper or the sacum skip sashem skipper. This species of butterfly, which really likes open areas, uh, finds its nectar for adults and host plants for caterpillars in open areas, likes to hang out there. And it's also been going to attract a species like the oak hair streak. So oak hair streak is restricted to forests and forest edges with lots of oaks. Their caterpillars eat oak leaves. They lay their eggs on, cat, on oaks. And then the adults hang out in the tree canopy and they either will frequent flowers, but they'll also sip um, sap from oak galls. So they're hanging out in the tree canopy. So they're only gonna be present if we have our bit of wild forest in our park. So those habitats in close proximity, we've got a third kind of species. And that's the species that needs both of those things. So tiger swallowtail is our, I think our state insect. Tiger swallowtails, adults will easily, as pro you probably know, frequent backyards, sunny gardens with all kinds of flowers, right? So the adults will take nectar in sunny places but they will lay their eggs and their caterpillars rely on trees. So tulip poplars, uh, black cherry, willows. So they're only going to occur in places where they've got both of those things together. So they need both of those habitat types, not one or the other. So that bumps our species number up even further. And there's lots of research that shows the more different habitat types you have in parks, especially kind of these wild areas, either unmowed grassland or forest, the more butterfly diversity you'll have. The other thing that the forest bit in our parks does is it acts as a refuge for butterflies and other animals. So this is, again, Sedgefield Neighborhood Park. This is our bed that was replanted a couple of years ago with a native, um, a native pollinator garden, but it was totally stripped. All the plants were taken out and totally redone. And that happens frequently, right, in the maintained parts of our parks. There's also things like mowing, maybe pesticide use, a variety of different disturbances. So to butterflies, this is a big deal, right? You can have kind of maybe nectar plants that you were relying on or host plants, and then they're suddenly taken away and they're gone. So forests act as a refuge where those species, if they can, can go hang out in the forest, wait it out, and they can return to the park when conditions, like the garden is kind of established and producing flowers, when conditions become more suitable. So for any species that can use both the open and forest areas, um, then that's great for that species. It can hang out in the forest and remain there. And there are studies that show that parks that have that forest 
uh, have more butterfly species exactly because of that refuge quality. So I think some of this was mentioned earlier today. We can have lots of forest in our parks, but we can't let it totally alone, right? It can't be totally wild because it's probably going to get taken over by invasive plants. That often happens. So there's actually, as you probably know, lots of ways you can get involved to try to help maintain your park. There's weekend green teams or day in the dirt, so specific events where you can go and help remove invasives, plant plants, weed, mulch, et cetera. Uh, pick up and pitch in litter cleanup. So here is one I found that's um, coming up. So it's Southview Park and Recreation Center Grounds. That's like an individual thing. You can just go with your family and pick up litter. Uh, some places, and I'm not sure if we have this here, but some places have an urban eco steward program. So people are assigned to a particular part of the park and maintain that space in the park. So they become really knowledgeable about that space and that's where they work. Seasonal projects like invasive plant removal and lots more, right? Trail maintenance, uh, maintaining benches, all kinds of stuff. So this is a really great way to make the habitat in parks really beneficial for species and get out in nature and do something good for your community. So here's Sedgefield Park in the center, and you can see the butterfly with its paths. I'm linking to, so I'm, I've put it in this context, this bigger context, because um, butterflies that you find in Sedgefield Neighborhood Park, for instance, aren't restricted to the park's boundary. So even if they look kind of frail and they're bobbing around, the average distance a butterfly moves over a day is 2,100 feet. So pretty big distance. So this circle is, has a radius of 2,100 feet. So that butterfly is bobbing around in what is mostly yard, right? So most of the habitat that it's finding outside of the park is private space, private yards. So it's going all the way to almost the Harris Teeter at South End, almost Park Road and everywhere in between. And this research has shown includes forest specialists. And sometimes specialists are not very good flyers. They're kind of they're sensitive, right? They're a little weak and they need to stop off and rest very frequently during the day. So they're out there and you can think of them out there. They need a little tree or something to stop off and rest in. And that can be in your yard. So in addition to birds, you can attract a whole bunch of butterflies to your yard uh, with putting in a pretty easy pollinator garden. These um, are these steps are taken from uh, the North American Butterfly Association. So they suggest to start small, plant species that are both host and nectar plants, at least three different species of each in equal proportion. Select plants that have a variety of flower colors, shapes, and bloom times. This is to maximize the number of species. Butterflies need light and sunlight. So at least six hours of direct sunlight a day, preferably in the morning so they can warm up. Anecdotally, I've heard that people have planted pollinator gardens, but the real thing that makes a difference is a puddling dish. So that can, that's how butterflies get nutrients. So they just sit on the ground and kind of sip mineral rich water. So just a flower pot saucer with landscape sand or soil and keeping it moist next to those plants will make a difference. And then adding some height means having your trees. So having flowering vines, flowering trees, and those places where a specialist can stop off. And then of course, avoid pesticide use as much as you can, right? I know if you've got poison ivy, you have to get rid of it, but avoid pesticide and obviously insecticide use as much as possible. And now finally, just to 
leave you with this thought. So wild nature in your park relieves stress and mental fatigue and improves your mood. Happy to talk more about this offline. There is increasing amount of research that shows that uh, and it actually wild nature, so not just maintained spaces, but actually having wild nature increases your ability to pay attention, relieves stress, makes you happier. I think one study showed the effect size of that. It was about a third of being married or unmarried, um, kind of the amount of difference that that makes. The research says to get out there in wild nature an hour and a half each week to get those benefits. Um, and what I've done with my class is I've started forest bathing. Uh, that's a Japanese practice where you kind of commune with the forest using all six senses and my students love it. So it's a wonderful class period. So that's something that you can check out next time you're in your park. And this is at Kilbourne Park, a nice little bench. So with that, I will remind you that nature is alive and well where you live. You can be just as connected to nature in your town or city as elsewhere. And you can enhance nature at your door. And I am always happy to talk about this. So please get in touch. And thank you for inviting me. It's great. Any questions from anyone? I do. Yes. I get conflicting information regarding feeding the birds. Yeah. Um, some say you shouldn't do it because you attract all the birds that you don't want, like the cow might not. It's, um, Starlings. Like starlings, or no, has, not the starling. No. It's a no, no. It's like one of those whole ha, uh, oh, house sparrows. House sparrows. House sparrows. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because every time I put down the um the uh, sunflower seed, they always said the only one that I can get. Yeah. So it. it the, oh yes. So um, some conflicting information about feeding birds. Feeding birds can sometimes attract species that you don't want that might have negative effects on other birds, like the house sparrow, for instance. It's going to vary from place to place. Um, what I've been reading about lately is house sparrows attacking eastern bluebirds and being really, you know, a negative influence on that species. You can try putting out different types of food or locating the fever, the feeder in different areas of your yard to see if you'll attract different species. Um, but it depends on what's out there, you know, kind of you're kind of subject to the bigger context. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And what you were reading with regard to um do they have any suggestions? Because I've got bluebird boxes and the blues go in and the sparrows come along right after them. Do they say anything that I'll just repeat the question. So are there any suggestions for what to do if you have house sparrows going in after Easter bluebirds in nest boxes? What I've read is just to actually remove the next nest box. And so remove it all together, wait some time, and then try again later, another season. Well, if we don't have any other questions, uh, it doesn't look like we have any on the Zoom. Um, well, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, we do have, uh, she has some copies of the book up here available for sale. Um, and we're going to go ahead and end the Zoom meeting now. Thank you all for joining. And we'll be sending out an email uh, in the next week or so with the recording. Thank you.